Jennifer. Um, this work is uh, joint work with my colleagues uh, Evan Chang and David Van Horn. So the, the title of the talk is A Vision. So this is more about the future work we'd like to do than about work we've already done. Um, but I'm going to try to communicate that work nevertheless. So it starts with this motivating example, which I'll kind of talk about throughout the talk. So suppose we have some JavaScript code or some code in your favorite language that's dynamic. So your programming language is a dynamic programming language. It loads some data from the file system, like maybe a database of author information. So imagine it's a comma separated uh, value file. And then imagine that we use some sort of database library in our extensible language that has this uh, call called OpenDB. So what authors is, is now this database of author information. And all the authors maybe are, field, uh, are objects with fields, like maybe they have citizenship fields and name fields and stuff. So we can do these combinators like we want to filter our database and now get a sub-database that's just the authors, say, from a particular country. Okay, so the point is that what, actu what actual fields are associated with each author is something that we don't know until we open this file. This file is going to dynamically define what these fields are. But we still want to do things like use them, uh, like project out of them, and know that they're going to work, that they're going to be there. So there's a tension. So I think there's this tension between software that's extensible, where it's easy to extend it with new behavior, new fields in this case, and software that's verified where we know certain things are going to happen or not happen. Uh, so in, in a static phase, the sort of traditional viewpoint of programming languages is there's these phases, static and dynamic. And in a static phase, we require type information, but sometimes type information is uh, information we don't have, like in the case of the database of authors. In the dynamic phase, it's going to provide us this uh, information, this dynamic information, like the content of this author's file. But at, at this point, maybe it's too late. We can't type check anymore. We're already running our program. So that's the, that's the tension. So imagine we make this uh, program a little bit longer now. And we keep alternating between these two modes. One mode is we're loading information from the outside world, like the file system. We're loading these files. And the other mode is we're using data type definitions that are in these files. So we're projecting out fields, like citizenship. Maybe we're joining two databases, and this doesn't make sense unless these fields are in the databases, namely author. OK, so that's the motivating example, this four-line example. And of course, it's not very interesting because there's only four lines. But you can imagine there's a bunch of hard work in between these lines, and we don't want to have to run our program over and over again to test it. OK, so. This is the traditional view, I guess like shown graphically, at least how I think of it. You have these lines, these four lines in your program. And you can have this choice. Either you're in the static phase or the dynamic phase. And in each phase, you're just running your program, either abstractly or concretely. And these balls or dots are supposed to represent you know, concrete states my program is in or sets of abstract states or an abstract state of some kind. If I'm type checking, it would be like the types. OK, but now I want to kind of reorient our brains a little bit um, to start thinking about this two-dimensional world. And now I've, I've written this term phaseless analysis. Um, the idea is that as I'm running my program concretely, that's the vertical dimension through those four lines, at lines one and three, I'm opening those databases with that information inside. And I'd like to sort of pause my program before it returns the database to the continuation. And at line one, pause the program and check that the rest of the program is going to work. All the field projections that use that file authors are going to work. And the same thing for line three, after I open books, there's two lines left to execute, I guess, the remainder of three and then four, and I'd like to verify those lines. And if there are more lines, I'd like to verify those as well. So let's go through this uh, same picture again. I've got these uh, record projections that I'd like to verify. So Intuitively, what happens is that while I'm running one, concretely my virtual machine or whatever is running line one, it's going to pause the, uh, the VM execution and do something with lines two, three, and four, the continuation. It's going to check some property about them, namely that these field projections work. And it can do that because at that moment, it's actually opened up that file and actually knows what fields are in that file. And I can, can resume execution knowing that that first projection is going to work on line two. And when I get to line three, I can do a similar thing and pause execution and try to verify this remaining projection is going to work. And meanwhile, I've already verified this one. 
because I did that when I paused on line one. Okay, so more generally, I guess the vision that we have includes these two terms. Um, one is progressive verification. That's just the idea that we want to rerun verification, in this case type checking, over and over again as we, as we execute the program. We're taking concrete steps and we want to keep type checking the continuation. The regressive validation I haven't uh, talked about and I probably won't talk about much until the end, but in this example it's just this idea that we could have a field projection that does a dynamic check. You know, is this field valid? If so, project it. But I'm imagining even more kind of like um, C-like language where field projections are not checked. And what I can do is once I verify that a field projection in the future is going to work, I can just rewrite that field projection from a checked one to an unchecked one. And that's what I think of as regressing. And regression in this case is good because it makes things cheaper. Okay. So the contributions of this particular paper, I guess I would say there's three of them. We have this um, kind of on-paper design for this virtual machine, which is really an abstract machine. Um, so there's a stepping semantics in the paper. I won't talk about that in the talk, except abstractly with pictures. Um, there's a gradual type system for a really simple database library. And again, I won't go through any inference rules. I'll just show pictures of how that works. But the key idea is that for each typing rule, or for certain typing rules, there's going to be two versions of the typing rule, one I'll call certain and one I'll call uncertain. If you're familiar with gradual typing, it's just the idea of, well, is it question mark or is it some other type that's not a question mark? So in the case of field projection, there'll be two ways of projecting a field, one where I know it's going to work and one where I'm not sure yet. And then we implemented this in Rust just to see that it work, to make sure it works. It, it does work so far for that example. Okay, so going back to that example. And the picture that I showed you before. The trick, I guess, um, the technical trick, is that we want the programmer who makes, say, the library in this case, the database library, to have some way, when you, whenever they open a database, to go into this reflective mode where they can reflect the current continuation and sort of check properties about it. So the database author, the database library author, is now al also like a type system author. And they're going to use some concept called ReflectCC to do this. So let me show you in terms of code for a second. So this is the, the client code, the two lines I showed you initially. Now imagine I'm implementing OpenDB. I'm the author of this library. Well, I'm going to actually have some code that actually does open a file and actually does read the contents of the file and produces some representation of the table inside that file. After I've done all that real work, th I'm going to do one extra step. I'm going to call, this is now a primitive of the virtual machine we're inside of, reflect CC. It stands for reflect the current continuation. So think about pausing the virtual machine, taking its state as a data structure, and giving that data structure to some function that the library author wrote called type check VM state. Now the program uh, that's going to run in that continuation is just this fragment return table. After we're done doing the check, we're just going to return the table to the rest of the program. And it's going to do whatever it does, those lines two, three, and four. So the key idea is that the library author gets to, un gets to think about what it means to be uh, invariant of their system, like field projections always work in this case, and they're going to write some basically type checking code that they call on the VM state. Okay, not only are they going to check the types, but they're also going to transform certain aspects of the continuation. So here, this, this line two and lines three and four are in our continuation right, because we're currently executing OpenDB. And before we actually run this code, we want to change this field projection to be one of those certain kind that we know is going to work, that's going to be cheap and fast. So we do that as well. That's another role for ReflexDC. Okay, so a little bit more abstractly, um, I've been talking about field projection, but you can imagine any kind of operation where there's a, a certain and an uncertain variety. So I'm using question mark for uncertain. So suppose we have V1 and V2, and we're trying to project out V2 as a field of V1, but we're not sure what the types of V1, what type of V1 is. So we don't know if it's going to work. That's why it's uncertain. And our VM actually won't even have a stepping rule for this. So we won't be able to run this program. The trick is before we get to the point where we actually have to run that off code, we want to transform into this verified kind, the certain kind, where we know it's going to work. And then there's just some 
standard kind of stepping rule that says how to step a field projection. Okay. That's the basic uh, formula for using ReflectCC. This is for um, field projections, but um, in the paper we have this more general concept of annotating a program fragment and then checking to see if that annotation holds or not. And that's supposed to be sort of domain independent. And if it holds, then you transform it, and then there's some sort of stepping rule that actually runs it. And for the version where you don't know if the types are going to work, maybe if you're like me, you just don't run the code at all. You don't run programs unless you know the next step is going to work. Okay, so that's the general thing. You transform uncertain moded code into certain moded code. And in terms of the gradual type system we have, there's a type for this mode and a type for this mode for each construct. For each construct that's moded, at least. Okay, so there's more details in the paper. In particular, there's a definition of this abstract machine. Um, we talk about how we sort of can annotate um, sub-expressions or sub-values with annotations that the checker can use. We talk about the ref uh, semantics of ReflectCC and these certain and uncertain annotations. And uh, maybe the most interesting aspect of this paper is this gradual type system for database libraries where we have bidirectional rules. If you haven't seen those before, they're kind of interesting. It's this idea that you can write a type checker without um, any kind of complicated inference stuff, just pushing type information around the program. In this case, it t can type check that four-line example as it runs the example, and it will never run a field projection that's uncertain. Okay, that's the main point there. So it's future work. Obviously, as you can imagine, type checking the program or verifying the program as you run it is potentially very expensive. So one of the things we want to do is realize this idea of progressive verification with general purpose techniques for incre incremental computation, which is one of the main things I work on. So kind of more specifically, the key challenge here is to somehow cache what we're doing as we're running the program when we check it and reuse that analysis work the next time we check the more of the continuation. Okay, the other thing is, as a library author, it's hard enough maybe to write a type checker, but how do I write an incremental type checker? That seems even harder. Um, so another part of the future work is to come up with some version of ML or some meta language where you can write type checkers and they can be implicitly incremental. Um, that's a pretty tall order. And the, the last thing is to have more interesting kind of um, regressive validation than just rewriting field uh, checks. My colleague Evan has some existing work about doing that. So we want to integrate that. Okay, so this is just a pictorial version of what progressive verification looks like. Imagine I do some work to type check while I'm running the OpenDB on line one, and now I do the OpenDB on line three. There's some common part of my continuation, the rest of the program that hasn't changed, except for the information I got on when I did the first uh, type check. And I basically want to somehow propagate whatever that change is so I don't have to redo it a second time. Okay, now I want to try to illustrate regressive validation or the, f the vision of it, but it's going to require a third dimension. So <laughs> this is the concrete execution down and sideways is abstract execution. And now kind of coming out at you is this idea of different versions of the program. So we're running one version of the program then we pause and we start to analyze it and we decide, ah, we can make the future of this, uh, the fu our continuation cheaper. So we rewrite our continuation to get a different one and we reason with that one. Okay, so that's the end of my talk. This is the summary slide, so um, I'm happy to take any questions you have. Thanks. Thank you.